I'd like to start with a quick question, which I think really is really important for patients. How do I bring up a clinical trial with my doctor? He's never mentioned it, but he's not at a large teaching hospital. You know, obviously each doctor is a little different, and, and, and Dr. Svatek and I both are commonly see patients for second and third opinions, uh, in part because um, you know, many patients and, some, and physicians want to see if there are other options that we have available that maybe they don't. Um, I don't know that uh, there is a perfect way. I think uh, patients have to be proactive because, uh, after all, uh, as much as we're empathetic, uh, the patients really have a lot more at stake uh, than we do. Uh, and uh, obviously, the uh, BCAN site has you know, a, a lot of information about clinical trials, uh, the, the National Cancer Institute actually has every clinical trial, uh, you know, online, and you can you can identify a bladder cancer trial. I really think that the best you can do is to, um, you know, you can print out a list of trials, or you can engage your physician to ask what what are their thoughts about clinical trials in general. I, I'm not sure that there's any real strategy beyond just being honest with your physician that. Uh, that you want to see what else can be done, especially in the case where, where standard treatments are not working well. Yeah, and I just want to uh, add to that that there are uh, urologists uh, that are in, you know, in a community and not in necessarily big academic centers that are really active in clinical trial research. So it would just start by inquiring, are you participating in any clinical trials of bladder cancer, um, and if so, what are they? Um, to, to start the dialogue. Okay, thank you very much. There's another question. What's the value of blue light cystoscopy, if you could speak to that? Blue light or fluorescent cystoscopy is a uh, method that uh, has been approved primarily for use in the operating room up to now, uh, where you instill uh, a substance uh, called hex, hexfix, which is really short for hexaminolabulonic acid, and what it does is it's, it's a, a substance that's not toxic, and it gets taken up by cancer cells, but when you look at it under a blue light, it looks pink. And there have been several uh, randomized trials that have shown that it can improve the detection of cancers uh, and by about 10 to 20 percent, in particular carcinoma in situ, which is often difficult to detect. Uh, most of the time it's used in the operating room, uh, in patients who have known bladder cancer to try to identify new lesions, but there's actually a large national trial right now to use it in the office with a flexible cystoscope to try to figure out which patients who you don't see cancer in might actually have cancer uh, that you may have missed with a white light. Um, there's still uh, lacking evidence that it improves survival or progression, but it did reduce recurrence in several large trials. Um, so there is probably a role for it um, in, in some patients with bladder cancer, if not many. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you. So that sort of segues into the next question. Are there any trials that you know of that are looking at early diagnosis or trials specifically looking at surveillance for recurrence? I think this is a question specifically looking at family members and others who might be at risk for bladder cancer. Yeah, so, uh, you know, actually Dr. Lotan is, I would say, one of the national leaders in early detection of, of uh, bladder cancer. He did a one of the very few screening studies, um, and I, I quite, him and I actually worked together um, in using uh, a, a urinary biomarker to aid in detecting cancer early. Um, Generally, I, we both feel that there is a role for early detection. There are older studies that have found that um, detecting bladder cancer early probably will improve survival because you can reduce the chance of finding bladder cancer when it invaded the wall of the bladder or metastatic, which unfortunately about 25% of all patients with newly diagnosed bladder cancer already have muscle invasive disease. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have right now is that a lot of people have microscopic blood in the urine but don't get adequately evaluated until they either see blood in the urine or it happens 
many times. And so uh, Dr. Svatek and I are actually working on a trial to uh, try to find if a certain urine markers uh, will help detect those patients early. As far as the family connection, it's a complicated issue because, in fact, uh, the, as Dr. Svatek pointed out, the genetics of bladder cancer are very weak. There are many cancers, such as prostate cancer and breast cancer, where there's a strong family link. But in bladder cancer, most of the time, whenever genetics are involved, they're not inherited, they're acquired. In other words, something like tobacco smoking caused you to have genetic changes that led to cancer. And as far as I can tell, uh, the biggest risk for family members is if they also smoke or if the parents smoke. But we don't really have a good, we don't usually screen family members unless they have microscopic blood. And uh, the only thing that I could recommend is if, so, if you have a relative who has bladder cancer and you have risk factors such as smoking, then you can look for blood in the urine or, you know, uh, your doctor can. And if you find it, then you won't get evaluated by having somebody look in your bladder. But, but we don't currently screen family members, for example. Okay, I have another question. Are there any types of trials that are available that you know of that you could speak to if BCG is not working? Yeah, this is an actually one of the most exciting areas from a clinical trials perspective because um, for, for two reasons. One is that there are a lot of new agents that are being uh, kind of developed, and this is one area where a lot of those agents are being tested. Um, I, I can think of three, maybe four trials right now that are kind of in the works for this specific population. The other reason that it's an exciting area is because, look, the, the, the fact is that this, this is a really challenging disease. When, when BCG has failed, m most patients get their bladder removed, and that's, that seems like a drastic maneuver, but we know that that's one of the only ways that we can uh, prevent it from progressing. So the FDA has actually been approached and have been to develop a kind of platform for licensing of new drugs specifically for these patients. And so it's kind of been spelled out. We've, they've met with urologists and bladder cancer experts, and we have a very uh, spelled out platform of how we can get licensed licensing for these new drugs in this particular disease state. So as an example of some drugs that are being evaluated, there is um, uh, a gene therapy drug uh, which, which aims to um, produce, have the, your, the, the bladder cells make interferon. That's one drug that's being evaluated and that would be filled into the bladder. There is a drug, um, immune therapy is a, is a really interesting and um, exciting uh, agents for bladder cancer. So there's what we call checkpoint inhibitors, which are immune therapies that are going to be evaluated in this particular population. Um, so, and, and there's a few of them out there. So there are, there's different tests, or I say different trials depending on the agent. So there, this is an, an exciting time for us in the bladder cancer field, particularly in that, in that disease state. Great. Thank you. All right, I have another question. What can we learn from atypia in pathology and cytology? This is, uh, this is a bit of a complicated question in some respects because uh, for the most part, it's a meaningless finding in the sense that uh, the pathologists typically have different ways of characterizing cells in the urine. They could be completely normal. Uh, they could be atypical, they can be reactive, they can be suspicious, or they can be malignant. Uh, atypia is common. We find it about 15 to 20 percent of patients, and it, it's common because uh, we are constantly doing things to the bladder that irritate it, between looking in the bladder and putting treatments in it. And so the cells look a little bit abnormal, but not abnormal enough to be suspicious or cancerous. Um, they're, for the most part, these findings should be ignored, but uh, at some institutions, including ours, we use the uh, a urine markers such as Eurovision to try to uh, figure out which one, of, which of those patients have cancer, uh, and um, and that especially is the case when we see something in the bladder because uh, BCG causes inflammation. 
sometimes the lining looks a little bit red, and then we don't know if that in combination with a tipia means the patient has carcinoma in situ. And so genetic marker often helps sort that out. But in the vast majority of institutions, the tipia by itself doesn't mean anything uh, in terms of cancer and can be safely ignored. Uh, unless there was also some finding other, you know, when they looked in the bladder. I'd like to take a moment and thank you both very much for a very informative program. And I'd like to thank Merck and Genentech for providing grants to enable us to have the Patient Insight webinars series on our website.